This is about radioactive decay, um, beginning your introduction to modeling radioactive decay. So here's an example. We have 16 kilograms of some radioactive substance. We're not going to be specifically name what the substance is because uh, I'll do pretty artificial contrived numbers to be simple at the start. And we know it has a half-life of exactly one year. And the first thing is to address what we could mean by that. And we're going to work up to a realistic idea of what radioactive decay is, how it works. Um, but I want us to start out with a very simplified, fanciful version that give, nothing less gives you the accurate mathematics. What I want us to imagine is that in that 16 kilograms of radioactive substance, there's a huge number of atoms, but a trillion, trillion atoms, and they're all sitting around, bored, and all they have to do, they just have one job, uh, every year they flip a coin. And if the coin comes up heads, then they spit off an electron or an alpha particle, depending on how they decay, and they change into something else. And that means they are no longer the same substance. So the amount of the radioactive substance we started with decreases if they change to something else. And since they're flipping a coin, it's either heads or tail, either heads or tails. And so in the first year, they go from 16 kilograms down to 8 kilograms. Obviously, that's not really what happens, but it turns out that's not a horrible model to, to think about these atoms sitting around flipping coins. And we'll, we'll refine that model as we go. But let's see what that, would, what that would tell us. They flip coins. At the end of the first year, half of them have decided to change into something else. Um, you might think, is it exactly half? Well, what if it came up at more than usual flipped heads, more than usual flipped tails? Well, with a trillion trillion, it's pretty. It's a pretty good bet that the proportion of them that came up heads is very close to half. And that's actually, again, that's actually a fairly accurate thing. It is a random process. We can't exactly predict how many um, are going to change into something else, how, many of, how much of the substance is going to disappear, but it's actually extremely accurate approximation to say that half of them are gone after a year. So the key thing is the second year. Okay, so let me just write that down. Um, half are gone after one year. Okay, the key thing is really the second year. Oh. If I go from, at t equals zero, I had 16 kilograms. At t equals one, I have eight kilograms. There are half of them left. Very natural extrapolation from that would be if it went from 16 to 8 then the next year they're all going to be gone and I'm down to zero that would be straight line a straight line approximation linear math and it's our default thing and our subconscious tends to default to that but it's not how it works because those 8 kilograms worth of particles lots and lots of atoms they flip the coin again and they don't all come up heads the second time they flip the coin only half of them come up heads again and so only half of them turn into something else, and half of it is remaining. Then the next year, they flip their coin again, and half of them turn into something else, half of it is remaining, two kilograms. And that's why it's called a half-life. The half-life is how long it takes for this uh, sample, whatever the radioactive substance is, to decay into half of what it started with. If it started with 16, one half-life later, it'll be at 8. Now, it's as if we totally start over fresh. I start with 8 kilograms, and I wait a year, it goes down to half of what, is, what it was before. I have 4 kilograms, I wait a year, and it's half of what it started with. And so it comes down 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, 1 half, 1 fourth. Notice what's happening is it's not the difference between the two that's the same. It's not 16 minus 8 is 8, and then 8 minus 0 is 8. That's not what's going on. It's the ratio. That uh, let, me, let me say it is 8 divided by 16 is a half. That's what the half-life is coming from. 4 divided by 8 is a half. 2 divided by 4 is a half. Every time I go one more half-life in the time, the time variable, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I'm going down by a factor of, of a half. So that's exactly exponential, an exponential function. Anything that goes down by ratios instead of by differences is an exponential function. And indeed, it's not hard to model this guy. That's going to be... It starts out with 16. This is like having a, a bit like having a bank account, but now it's decreasing. So that's our initial amount. And then the, the repeated power, the thing that's getting multiplied by itself over and over again, let me put that as a nice fraction, is 1 half. So let's make sure this is really what we want. It's when t equals 0, it gives us 16. When t equals 1, 16 times a half is 8, and it's correct. 16 times a half squared is 4, and we're right on the money.
So this is exactly what we've seen graphs of so far, of some sort of uh, multiplier amount to get it right at t equals 0 times a number less than 1 raised to the t power. Let's see what the graph of that looks like. Okay, oh, I just had it written, rewritten. I don't need it again, though. Okay. And it looks like a decaying exponential graph, starting at 16 and going down. One thing to notice, uh, we might do some problems where we read graphs and we try to figure out things like half-life. We can read that off pretty easily. We, we just look at what it started at as 16, and then I look for, okay, how long did it, did it take to get down to 8? Ah, okay. Looks like right about 8, yeah, one year. Okay, so let's just modify it just a little bit. Didn't really want to produce anything particularly complicated here. Um, and then you can look in the book for an example with slightly more realistic numbers, and then there'll be a problem about the same issue. What if it was 100 years? What if it was the half-life of, of 100 years? Okay, here is the original setup. I haven't changed anything yet. Okay, very, very similar. And let's say we still start with 16 kilograms, just to make it simple. Well, after one year, we definitely haven't gotten down to 8 kilograms yet. After 100 years is when the sample has gone down to 8 kilograms. After 200 years, that's two half-lives. So these are guys you can imagine, again, not obviously not a realistic model, but the math, it gets the math pretty much correct, that every 100 years they flip a coin and half of them go away. Now, 100 years later, half of them have flipped a coin again. There's the, the one in four that's a lucky survivor. Then it's a one in eight that's a lucky survivor. They got heads all three times. Each time when they flip the coins, half of them go away. And so the only thing that's different, not too surprisingly, is that the time scale is just longer. Now, everything that happened in zero to six years before happens in zero to 600 years before. So what's gonna hap have to be true here? So this is probably the interesting thing. How does this get modified? Okay, well, it's still gonna start at 16. One half seems like the right base still because it's all about a half life. And we're gonna see other ways to do this like with a base of E, for example. Um, and so the only thing I can modify is the T here. Well, what I want is when T is 100, I want this to be 16 times 1 half to the 1 power. So what I can do is I can divide t by 100. So when I take 100 divided by 100, I get 1. 16 times a half is 8. Take 200 divided by 100 is 2. It just replicates exactly what I had before, but now the time scale is different. Notice what I've done. I've done one of the standard transformations on the function. So I've got this function, and what does it mean to take the independent variable? That's here. It's t. And ooh, I forgot to change this. I had an earlier video. This was A. Let me change this to Q. I'm agreeing with our new book that's Q for quantity instead of A for amount. It doesn't really matter. Well, what am I doing to that original graph? When I take T and I change it to T over 100, think a second. I might want to pause the video. Does that shrink it or stretch it? And I hope you pause the video and figure it out yourself. Okay. What that does is it stretches. And that's what it should do, so that it takes that much longer to, to happen. Let me delete some of this blank space I put in. Okay, a little more. I put in a lot of blank space. I just want to tighten it up a little bit. Okay, so now here's the new graph, the solid graph. And now it's on the time scale of 600 years. It goes from 16 to 8 to 4 to 2 to 1 to a half to a quarter. Compare that with the original graph. I put that in with the dashes. That was the same kind of graph, but it's much more dramatic. It almost looks like an L. Uh, on this time scale, it was going really quickly to something very, very close to zero. So these don't exactly look like the same graph just stretched or shrunk, but it, they really are. Um, that if I squish this guy back way towards the axis, it gets very steep here and then very flat here. Okay, so there's some very simple models of uh, radioactive decay. The main thing we want to remember is avoiding this big, uh, this easy mistake to make, which is if it goes from 16 to 8 in one year, it's going to go from 8 to 0 in the next year. That's not true. And you, one way, not the most uh, accurate way, but a, a, a for, totally acceptable way to get yourself out of that trap is to think of these things flipping coins and uh, to think how that's, that wouldn't have everybody go away at year two. Okay, so you're going to be doing some problems um, on this with somewhat more realistic numbers.